a &E Networks is a proud sponsor of the Banff World Media Festival and Women of Power session. We are so honored to continue this tradition of bringing together women pioneers in our industry, despite such extraordinary circumstances. We are also proud of our company's legacy, supporting women in front of and behind the camera. From powerful docuseries like Surviving R. Kelly and upcoming Surviving Jeffrey Epstein, to movies like The Clark Sisters, The Kamaya Mobley Story, and our upcoming Wendy Williams biopic, we at A&E remain committed to uplifting women and telling their stories, even when those stories are difficult. We're especially honored to be here today, along with our partners, Chorus and the Banff World Media Festival during such extraordinary times in our civil rights history. Before we continue this afternoon and hear from an extraordinary group of women, I wanted to leave you with a quote from Serena Williams that we hope informs our conversations. The success of every woman should be an inspiration to another. We should raise each other up. Make sure you're courageous, be strong, be extremely kind, and above all, be humble. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jen Kuzmik, the Executive Director of Banff. It is my honor to welcome you to the 2020 Women of Power Lunch. BAMP's Women of Power Lunch is always a really inspirational event. Every year I come away from it often having had a laugh, maybe even a little cry, but always feeling incredible about the women and the supportive network that we have in our industry. At every festival, we program panels with leaders from the C-suites at the largest and most influential media companies in the world. Let's put it this way. There are simply not enough black, indigenous, and people of color in those power positions. There are not enough women in those power positions. Earlier today, in the Banff Day opening remarks, I noted that we announced the third year of our Netflix Banff Diversity of Voices initiative and the second cohort of the Banff Spark Accelerator for women in the business of media. These programs will serve up to 700 professionals and have a core mandate to address gender inequity, and intersectionality to empower creators, producers, and entrepreneurs from marginalized communities, Black, Indigenous, and people of color that work in the Canadian media industry, as well as LGBTQ2S+, and professionals with accessibility challenges. Banff Spark in particular is about economic gender parity. She who holds the purse strings holds the power. We need more women running influential media companies. We need more women in those power positions. I'd encourage all of you to get involved with Banff Spark and with Diversity of Voices to mentor, support, and give opportunity to the incredible people in these programs. And as part of the media industry, it is our responsibility to do better, to be better, and to use the power we have to force change. We can do more, and we will do more. Here today, we have gathered some of the most incredible women who are change makers, innovators. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here today. It's an honor to welcome you to the Banff virtual stage. I know today's conversation will be important, inspiring, and enlightening. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Ingu Kang from The Hollywood Reporter who will introduce the panel. Hi, uh, this is Ingu Kang from The Hollywood Reporter, where I am a TV critic. And today we are finally here after a bit of technical ado with the Women of Power Luncheon. Uh, we have three amazing panelists. First, we have Nisi Nash, actress of Claws. She has won Emmys. She's a producer. Uh, you might have seen her most recently in Never Have I Ever and my favorite series of hers, Getting On. Um, <laughs> hi, Nisi. Hello. <laughs> uh, we also have Mo Adubu from London. She is the CEO of Ebony Life. And Ebony Life is Africa's first global black and entertainment lifestyle network. Uh, yesterday, just yesterday, they announced a multi-series Netflix deal. Uh, very exciting time for Mo. Hi, Mo. Hi. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Oh, 
I know you've got more on you than that. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Tonya Lopez. She is the executive vice president of movies, limited series, and original movie acquisitions at Lifetime. Um, I know she's got some projects she's very, very uh, proud of. Hi, Tanya. Hi, guys. Nice to see everybody out there. I sort of wanted to start off with everyone's sort of origin story of how they became the person that they are, or like a really strong experience that really taught them who they are and what kind of person they want to be. And so just to get like a feel for the panel, I was hoping we could start with these origin stories. Um, well, let's start with Tanya. Um, I think what I was an agent, uh, uh, I was an agent for 20 years and that's how I really started in this business. And I think I learned to pre appreciate helping people fill their dreams. They would sit in front of me and say, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. And I would be able to be a part of it. And I think that really influenced my passion and has I've been able to share that as I've sort of grown into this job at Lifetime. But I think that was one of my most, that's really transformed me as an executive. Sounds great. Helping people achieve their dreams. <laughs> um, Mo. Yes. Um, hi, everyone again. For me, um, I mean, I started out life as a HR consultant, HR in, in HR and, and training and recruitment. I worked with ExxonMobil for many years of, as head of HR and training and administration. So I was pretty much, you know, involved in, in a life of nine to five. I was born in England, went to school in England. And I think deep down in my consciousness, deep down has always been the need to have to justify who I was. My mere existence on this earth was always explaining to the people around me who I was as a woman of color. So I turned 40 and I said to myself, you know what, I am done doing nine to five and working in HR. I am gonna step into the world of media. And I started a talk show. And from the talk show, I decided that, do you know what? It's still not enough. I need to do a little bit more. Then I decided to do another TV program and another TV program. And then I said, you know what? I need to start a TV network. And then I decided to start a, a channel, an entire network. And then I said, I needed to get into the world of films. So again, we started making movies. Um, and it's just been one thing after the other in that regard. I mean, yesterday we're all talking about the fact that black lives matter, you know, black stories matter, but this is something that I have been talking about and have been championing for the longest time. So it's wonderful to now see it, you know, sort of come 360 degrees and saying, we really now do have an opportunity whereby we can tell our own stories. And that is what wakes me up every morning, running Ebony Life Media right now. Yeah. You're wonderful. Um, Nisi. I guess my origin story uh, goes several years back. I was five years old and I saw the most gorgeous black woman I had ever seen in my little five years of living on a television show. She had on a long red dress and her eyelashes looked like butterflies. I looked at my grandmother and I said, who is that? She said, baby, that's Lola Falana. And in that moment, I feel like God stamped on the canvas of my imagination, my destiny. I look at my grandmother and I say, I want to be black, fabulous and on TV. And so how I got here was to believe the first imprint that was laid on my mind about the rest of my life. Now, other people may not have believed it, and that's why it is not called them esteem, mama esteem, us esteem. It's called self-esteem because I always believe that which I feel like God showed me. And my only job was to walk that thing out. And here you are. I wish I had that. <laughs> I think I'm not alone. Um, we're going through a, I think it has to be said, like a historical political moment right now. Um, how is this moment sort of galvanizing you or influencing how you think about your work and your priorities in life? Um, we'll start with Nisi again. Um, I feel like for me, my work has always been 
influenced by being a black woman. It is not because we are in a moment in time that my mind has changed. You know, I did when they see us before this moment in time. You know, I've I've been a part of projects and roles that I've decided to take or not decided to take based on who I am and how I show up in the world. So I, I believe it's kismet. We are we are experiencing a moment in time that we've been at in the we were here in the fifties, in the sixties, in the seventies, in the eighties with Rodney King. With you know, so the 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 time isn't so much influencing me as as much as the experience of being a black woman in entertainment has always influenced me are you able to talk about say a role that you just felt like wasn't right for you and you sort of had to say that no well i remember being at a point in my career where i said no to being a sassy black anything. I was over it. I, I, I don't want to be a sassy black mama, a sassy black neighbor, a sassy black friend, which is a term that is often used when they try to capsulate a, a, a particular demographic. Oh, you can be in an audition and hear, can you do that a little more sassy? What does that even mean? <laughs> and I remember Yikes. when I put out a, 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 a call to my entire team and was like, absolutely no. If it leads with this as a character description, don't even call me. Because I have a track record to show you that I am not a one trick pony and I can do more than one thing. So if it doesn't encompass a fully, you know, flawed, vulnerable, funny uh, human being, then I'm not interested because sassy is one note and I've been there and I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, Mo, can you sort of talk about what, if the current political moment has clarified anything for you or changed anything for you? I don't think it has changed anything. I think what it has done is that it has reinforced what we have always known. Um, I mean, we, we look at the media over the last couple of weeks and we look at the fact that some programs are being taken off air. I mean, it's like we have always said for the longest time, why are we being represented in this way and manner? Why don't you fully want to understand who I am as a woman of color, as a person of color? We've always said it, but it's as if nobody was listening. But all of a sudden, everybody's now woken up and said, oh, this is what we now need to do. We have been singing this song forever. I mean, I have been in this industry for the last 15 to 16 years, and I have been saying the same thing from the minute I started till, till yesterday. And so when I now hear that, oh, you know, Bain, you know, there's going to definitely be a, a bigger commitment, you know, to, to programs for black people and to people of color and to ethnic minorities, I'm like, well, we've been saying that all along anyway. So it's like, thank you so much for finally doing what is right so it's 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 great that it's happening but should we have should it have taken this long to have realized that we were not doing the right things you know so so that for me is a bit of a yeah i'm like what what's everybody thinking i mean did everybody think it was okay before so yes thank you that we're now doing something different and everybody's thinking differently and this will create more opportunity for, for people like me and for people of color in front and behind the screens. Our writers, our crew, our actors, our presenters all need to be seen and they need to be heard. And the reason why there's sometimes so much conflict in the world and it's because you don't know who I am. If you don't know me and you don't understand my makeup as a person, then how can you respect me? How can you regard me? So it's so important that we have an opportunity to share our stories fully, fully. Why does it have to be about something that's so, so important? I mean, can't it just be about the fact that, oh, there's a lovely film about this couple that just got married. I mean, I have to watch movies every day about white people that do absolutely nothing, but just wake up in the morning, go to work and go home, and that's the end of the series. But if it's something about a black person, there must be, you're asking me to create something that is so like out of the ordinary, but it's okay for your stories to be ordinary. So why can't my stories just, represent the ordinary me 
that everybody else has. I mean, I have the same dreams and aspirations like everybody else in the world. And that's what I want audiences to... around. No, sorry. I'm going to object to the fact that you are calling yourself ordinary, but we'll, we can come back to that. But I did want to ask you, as someone who is working on African co-productions and wants to bring sort of a more Nollywood feel to, or sort of have more African stories brought to the greater like mainstream. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and why African representation, not just black representation is important to you. Well, I wanna say that Africans are the original storytellers. You know, we, it's just that we have remained creatively silent in the world that we now know to be the world of storytelling as it's come to be, as in on the big screen or as on the small screen. But, you know, I think the day-to-day -day African, I mean, I remember my grandmother sitting me down at night and telling me incredible stories about, you know, things that have happened in Africa. But have we ever had an opportunity to take these stories to the, to the, to the, to the big screen or to the small screen? No, we haven't. Now, two years ago, we signed a co-production deal with Sony Pictures Television. And one of the major projects we're working on is called the Dahomey Warriors. Now, the Dahomey Warriors were a group of incredible African women that lived many, many years ago that were fighting wars on behalf of the king of Dahomey. They were strong, they were influential, you know, but we didn't, nobody knows about this story. So again, it's to say that it's, it's time to take stories like that, develop them and take them to the big screen as a massive epic production of a time when women in Africa were really at the forefront out there fighting wars and, you know, safeguarding the lives of, of, of citizens of their country. So it's to say that there are so, so, so many other stories like that, that just need to be told. And I am pleased that we are at the forefront of bringing some of these stories um, to the world. I mean, the deal that we've just signed with Netflix, we have two major um, IP projects that we're going to be launching that with, you know, so it's, it's, there, there, there's a lot to be said. We haven't said anything. You don't know our stories and we're really happy that now we're going to have an opportunity to do so. You don't know our story. <laughs> wow. It's really wow. like a what? rallying cry right now. <laughs> you, well, I don't you want don't. that on the shirt. I mean, the, yeah. You don't know our stories. Yes. I mean, the only story that's been told continually about the black man from Africa is that of the slave trade. And it's a time in our lives that it's, 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 it's one of the most painful memories. I mean, that anytime I think and the pictures that I've seen, it's painful, it's hurtful, but that's the only story that ever gets told about who we are in, in that the studios are sort of happy to pick up. And yes, it is a painful part of our lives, but is that all there is to us? You know, there's black so trauma. much more. Yes, black trauma, you know? I mean, I, I remember I was 16 when fame came out. Fame, I wanna live, you know? And for me, it was such, I was on such an incredible high to see something where I am seeing people of color that are not depicted as prostitutes or some flipping criminal at 16. I'm 56 this year and fame came out when I was 16. So you can imagine that I've gone from one to 15 and a half and never having seen anything on television that showed me that a black person could actually go to a school of performing arts and become somebody and, and dance and have aspirations like anybody else. There was nothing on television before then. It was the first time ever. So I'm not saying that there hasn't been, you know, progress, but it's just not enough. So it's, 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 it's great to see that we are having more of a conversation and we need to be in the room. Where if, if our executives are not there, then how are you gonna make decisions about the type of programming that represents me or represents our people? Well, Tanya is so executive. Well, what um, do you know over <laughs> here at Lifetime? <laughs> Tanya, no, can you talk think, a little bit about, yeah, go ahead. I laugh because I keep this post-it note on my um, computer that says you have no lines in this scene, Tanya, so that when I get on calls, I just don't get so crazy and, and involved. But uh, I feel like so honored to be here with Nisi and Mo because I think you guys, you, you certainly are speaking your truths. I think at Lifetime, you know, when I transitioned over from being an agent 
to Lifetime. It was a it was a a network that really really honored and respected women and continues has continued in that legacy. And I, when you when you ask about why now, what's happening now, I feel like you know we've been pushing that boulder up a hill. And the good news is there's some people behind us now pushing that boulder up a hill that I don't feel so alone pushing it up with my colleagues that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. everybody's rising up and saying, you know what, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to try to talk about women and tell these stories. And, you know, Nisi brought up with, before we started about this amazing movie we did called The Clark Sisters, which most of the company had never heard of these ladies. And the, they are phenomenal women and it caused such a sensation to an audience that we, that is, was certainly underserved and we overserved up what was stories about women that, that, that all women want to see. And I think that's, that's the, the drum we have to keep beating is that mm -hmm. we don't have to stay in certain lanes, that we don't have to say that only this kind of woman likes this kind of movie, that that feels like it dumbs it down and it minimizes who women are and what they want to learn and what they want to see. And I really feel like Lifetime is in that absolutely perfect place right now to do that. You know, it's challenging. You know, there are hurdles and all sorts of things that come our way that says, well, you can do this, you can't do that, you know, um, you know, you're not, it's not going to be buzzy enough, it's not going to break through the clutter, you got all these streamers coming at you, and you know what, I think a good story wins. I think mm. a good story wins. And the other thing I know is that women tell each other what they want to watch. Word of mouth is like the best way i mean you know i know all the time someone will say to me just like we were talking though you got to see this movie and you go okay great mm -hmm. send it to me yes, you know and yes. i think women want great storytelling and um you know i'm excited i'm not disillusioned by it it's re-energizes mm -hmm. me i mean i like mm -hmm. people getting all fussy and angry and on top of it I love that. I love that. I think it gets, I think disruption is everything mm -hmm. in every business. So there you go. Um, I feel like everybody wants change, but also just because we want change to happen, obviously doesn't mean that change is going to happen. And so I was hoping you guys could share um, a story or two of a thing that you decided either for yourself or for the people around you. Like, I'm going to make this change and you saw a change happen. Anyone can jump in. I, I think I said, we're gonna have women, we're gonna give people jobs. We're not just gonna let have women shadow other directors. Women are done shadowing, give them the job. Give them the job and also prop them up so they're not set up for failure. It's one thing if a director or a woman has never directed, all right, let's surround her by people that are gonna lift her up and that she's going to succeed. And I think, you know, years ago, we started this program called Broad Focus. We've been doing this for years. Now, the truth is, I think we can do more. And I think what we has to be is that we really have to help women behind the camera. And I don't mean just a director. I mean, editors and DPs, and these are all places that we have to provide jobs and support women on because they're not gonna get it if, if we're not providing the jobs. Yeah. What is like a way that yeah. you can help prop up a, uh, a woman who maybe is a little bit more inexperienced or someone who's clearly like a visionary, but they might ha not have like the connections yet. Like you said, you wanted to help prop up women behind the scenes. Um, can you give like a concrete example of that? Uh, a concrete example is of there was a script supervisor uh, who wanted to direct and we said, okay, 
and she directed a Christmas movie for a last a last year with Kelly Rowland, A Merry Little Christmas, and she's going to direct another one. Um, and these are specifically women of color. I think all women are struggling to get opportunities, but obviously I really believe the women of color not, are not getting them because they're getting the first chance. They're not getting the second job. You know, it's, it's, you got to give people the second job, not just the mm. first one, because mm. that means that they've succeeded. Mm. You're going to say well, something. I, see, what I, are you saying? I, I, I also think that you begin where you are, okay? Um, as an actor, I have never gotten a job and not gotten somebody else a job. I don't play that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a grip. I don't care if it's getting your music placed in the series. I don't care if it's a stand-in, if it's hair, if it's makeup, what, whatever it is. If that door is open for you, bring someone along and move them in that space with with a firm, you know, look in the eye that says, mm. and when you get your turn, you yeah. bring somebody with you. And that is the way I think you do. You have to begin where you are. You know what I mean? Can you be a third banana on a TV show and then introduce the network to an executive that they didn't know? No, you cannot. <laughs> but you can start where you are and say, being in this place right now, I'm going to bring in an assistant. I'm going to refer some a, a, a grip that I may know. I'm going to get another PA on. I'm going to you do what you can from the space that you're in at the time. And eventually, you know, which is what I did. I used to host a series called Clean House. And um, it was on the now fantastic. Style it Network. was fantastic. Thank yes. you. <laughs> I did it for nine seasons, but I kept slowly. There were I would stand in front of a camera and go, "I'm Nancy Nash, and this is Clean House," and look out at a sea of white faces. <laughs> I started to slowly, 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 slowly just invite people in, invite people in because I was leading the charge so I could do that. Invite people in. I stood up in front of that camera one day and there was so much diversity in, in, in front of me. And by the way, the world is bigger than just white and black people. Let me just go on and say that. Um, I, I, I saw so many people standing in front of me. I said, I'm Nisi Nash at Oh, 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 look at all these people. And I literally had a moment because I changed the fabric. I changed the culture on that set to be one that was so much more inclusive than it was when I first got there. And that's the, that's the charge. Yeah. It is. The infiltration I mean, method. I love that. I mean, for me. No, you open the door and people change. have to walk through. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, change for me. If I'm looking at change, and what can I what can I say that I wanted to lead the charge on? It was about making African stories go global. And when this idea occurred to me, it was like I remember having a conversation with somebody who works in the UK, um, and he said to me, "Forget it. It's never going to happen. Your stories are never going to go global. It doesn't. It's really hard to get commissioned, and it doesn't work like that. I've been working in England for so many years. It doesn't happen." Now, by the way, when I signed this deal two or three days ago, this person sent me an email. I still haven't replied because if I had listened to him, nothing would have happened. And I was like, "Okay, thank, thank you for you. that information. I left it somewhere." But I still went ahead and said, okay, I am going to find a way to break through. Our stories must become global stories. Now, it's taken a lot of work. It's taken not taking no for an answer. It's taken, I am going back and I'm knocking your no door down and I'm saying, you need to listen to me. It's taken investing in IP, some of the best stories, like the Netflix deal we have. We're, we're going to be breaking out with two incredible series. One is called the secret lives of Baba Segi's wives. And it's about a man, because polygamy does exist in Africa. It's a, it's a novel by Lola um, Shonei. And it's about this man that marries these three wives and decides to marry a fourth one. And by the time he marries the fourth one, all hell breaks loose. Anyway, that's story number one. Story number two is Death and the King's Horseman. Again, it's original IP by, the, the, the play was written by Nigeria's first Nobel laureate, Professor Wallace Shoyinka 
incredible story about when the king dies. It's about the fact that the horseman has to die with the king. Now, this king has a massive dilemma on the day that the king dies about the fact that is he now ready to die himself? So that's the second major IP project that we have. Now, don't those sound like ground projects, you know, to you that the world should want to know about my history and things that have happened in my continent? So for us, it's about pushing our stories out there. And I'm glad, and I want to say a big thank you to Netflix for listening to me, a big thank you to Sony for listening, a big thank you to AMC, some of the others I can't mention now because, you know, um, you know, Americans are very fond of making you sign NDAs and things like that. But within the fullness of time, others will be will, will be mentioned. But it's to say that I am so pleased that for the first time ever, someone from the continent is now able to tell the stories. In the past, it is Americans telling me my story. You cannot know me more than I right. know myself. So why are you going to come and right. tell me who I am? <laughs> Hello, right. I can't work. I will tell you who I am and you will listen to me about this is the stories about who my, you know, that's, and that's, and that's kind of where we are. So but thank you that, guys. But that's where, uh, but that's where authenticity comes. And I think that's yes. the change. I think the change is yes. women directors directing women's stories. They feel yes. different. You know, the women writers, black women writers writing about black women, it feels different. Yes. It feels authentic. Absolutely. And the audience yes. responds. They know. They yeah, know when they it's do. real. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. I you mean, know. if you're not authentic about your stories. So, so yeah, we're excited. <laughs> Tonya, I'm coming to you with a story, Tonya. I've got a story for you. All right, let's do it. Well, I've got my whole yeah. list of things that I'm sending you. So we will be very busy. <laughs> Yes, yes, okay, yes. Wait, and Nisi's coming to Nigeria. Nisi, Nisi's on her way to Nigeria. Yeah, Nisi's on her way to Nigeria. If I can get away, I'll be on that plane. Yes, yes. Post COVID, you guys are coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, Ingo, you, you, Ingo, you, of course, you're invited. Hollywood reporter, hey, oh. we've got to have you on ground. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm in. Um, unfortunately, I think that we're out of time. Thank you so much, ladies, for this amazing, really candid, um, really like first person conversation. It was such a great opportunity to really learn from your experiences. Um, yeah, and I look forward to that trip to Nigeria. So yes, yes. we're gonna we're gonna make it happen. <laughs> Keep using your voice, Inga. Please keep using your voice. Yes, yes. I will. Nisi, come on. <laughs> Sonia, Mwah. Mwah. love you guys. Mwah. See you later. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.